So we're still waiting on a uh, quorum, is that correct? Looks like we Rob, have I believe we have a quorum. Oh, good. That's right. I um I leave it to others to uh to do the count. So uh and I believe, well, uh, I'll call this uh, regular voting meeting of the Board of Education to order. Uh, we do have a quorum. I recognize the quorum. Um, and we are in open session, uh, as is our custom and uh, lately our habit over the last number of years. That the, once we are in open session, uh, we do uh, typically go into exec session. We will do that again tonight, and um, and I will um, look for a motion to do so for the appropriate I, reason. I move that we enter executive session for the purposes of collective negotiation pursuant to Article 14 of the Civil Service Law and employment history of a particular individual. Second. Second by Pat, and uh, thank you both. And Emily, if you could do call the roll, and we will uh, vote on that motion. Rob Ainsley. Yes. Aaron Croyle. Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Yes. Eldred Harris. Yes. Moira Lang. Yes. Nicole Lefebvre. Chris Malcolm. Yes. Ann Reichlin? Yes. Patricia Wazelin? Yes. Very good. Uh, we will now be moving into uh, exec session in a breakout room. And so we'll be seeing that pop up. And so folks, if uh, you are on with us, we will be, we'll be back in approximately an hour, probably you know, around seven o'clock go into our regular uh, agenda for the rest of the evening. And so we're going to join our breakout room and we'll be back. And so uh, look for us, look for us in a bit. Thanks everybody. Well, welcome back everyone. We are back in public session and I do believe we have our board members back or at least a quorum, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we, um, we will move on with our regular public meeting uh, on this night on August 25th. Uh, summer is not quite over, but uh, there's much to do. So let's, um, let's move on and I just ask, uh, I'll ask Sean or others, there's no modification to the agenda tonight, correct? Um, um, that is correct. Uh, Ann has just asked to make sure that we discuss the consent agenda. Oh, absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll get there. So um, we, um, but our agenda is as published and in front of us. And uh, up next, we will have public comment period. For a public comment period, we have asked folks to try to use the hand raise signal. Um, you can also reach out to uh, Emily, uh, um, Tracy Arm, uh, send uh, a chat uh, to her and we can follow and try to unmute folks um, as need be. So uh, if someone raises their hand, we will see it. Or if you reach out and send a chat, we will make sure that we uh, follow up with allowing for public session. And Rob, I just ask that we give it a minute to ensure that we have given people ample time. Not sure, and so folks know, um, folks in the public um, certainly have an opportunity to speak for three minutes and then board responses uh, for the board members who wish to respond 
will come after. We do not respond to each speaker in turn. Um, glad to hear from everyone and then the uh, board can respond and then I'll be on to the rest of the meeting. I'm killing time. So, so. Nope, appreciate it. So again, you can send a chat to Emily Tracy Arm. Uh, you can also use the ICSD Let's Talk portal. Uh, that is one of the ways in which we get a great deal of feedback. And we um, encourage um, all community members to contact board members. We have been uh, very busy as a board responding to as many emails as possible. So please feel free to send us an email uh, if need be. Uh, if okay with our board members, then I would presume that at this point in time, we do not have any um, members of the public wishing to contact us or at least able to do so in this format. So, uh, well, I apologize. Melinda. We do have one member. Yes, Melinda Oaks. Melinda, I will unmute you now. We can't hear you one second, apologies. Great, can you hear me? We can, good to see you. Good to see you too, thank you. I wanna say thank you for taking my comment. Um, and first, I want to be on record as saying that I appreciate all of our educators and administrators and board members. I know you're working hard and you care deeply about our children and the families in this community. And I especially want to thank the board members. I can only imagine the volunteer hours that have gone into this year, and I know it must be exhausting, coupled with the other parts of your life. Um, I want to say I listened to the board meeting that included Dr. Brown's announcement about the school start delay. And I apologize for my dog. <laughs> Um, I understand the complexities as he stated them, and still I feel as if there's a lack of transparency in terms of the reopening and in responding to the specific questions that are asked by the public, include, including reopening criteria, equitable ways of creating learning pods for families supportive of more collective or classic style education environments, volunteer test cohorts, academic standards, and more. And from the outside, it sounded a little bit to me as if the board members were actually in favor of returning to school as originally hoped, um, as almost all of you said that you wished that was the case in your comments. Um, again, I apologize for my dog. Um, specifically tonight, I'm first asking for more visibility into what role the union or the unions are playing in the back to school effort and if or how their input differs from the candid opinions of individual teachers. And related, can you generalize on whether more or less stakeholders, including teachers and, and families, um, were in favor of a return to school? I also believe that you are indeed an organization that values innovation, as Dr. Brown stated. And I've applauded many examples of this in the past, but I'm not seeing the fruits of that innovation in any of the current back to school planning that I've heard. So for example, the choice of remote or in-person learning doesn't necessarily strike me as innovative by definition. Um, so can you please provide some more examples of how you see innovation in the current planning? And then finally, in addition to making efforts to remain healthy and to be patient, what can we do to help? And how can we be a part of the solution and not just by standards? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oaks, greatly appreciate that. Um, if I'm waiting to hear from Emily. I do not see anybody else uh, who has their hand up or who is looking to speak. And board members, if I'm missing anyone, please let me know. And so with that, I uh, there have been no requests via chat, so I bring it back to President Ainsley. Very good. Uh, thanks, Mindy. Um, just board responses at this time to comments or anything else that you've heard uh, throughout the week. Melinda, I, I thank you for speaking. Um, I really appreciate it. As far as, you know, what the board wants or is thinking or how we feel, I mean, I, I, I can speak for myself, which is to say, this is so much more complicated than anything that that maybe came across I mean for me myself I mean on a personal level I, I can't send my kids to school but as a board member I'm looking at what everybody needs individually and I'm hearing from 
families and everybody has something different that they need. And we're hearing from teachers who are concerned for their health. It's, it's so incredibly difficult and there's nothing easy about this. Um, and I, you know, you mentioned transparency. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about transparency. I think it's just messy. Everything is messy now and it's, it's because of the pandemic. And I, I hope that we can answer questions, specific questions about what's going on. I mean, I, I think that we have been. As far as innovation, I do see teachers and staff being innovative right now. Um, it might not seem that way, but I, I just, on, again, on a personal level, I had a meeting with, um, with a, a team of teachers regarding my own child, and they are thinking outside of the box to accommodate his needs. So there's a lot of innovation going on. Uh, and I think, I think when you start to talk to the teachers and see what's going on at each school, you're gonna see that. Um, I hope this makes sense. I think we're all just kind of drowning in the mess that all of this is and everyone's exhausted and um, <laughs> the computer screens are driving me crazy. But um, thank you again for speaking. And uh, Melinda, I'd like to also address um, issues that you brought up. When, when Dr. Brown first proposed um, giving families and teachers choice, I thought that was incredibly um, positive and innovative having, you know, spending a lot of my waking hours looking at what is going on in various districts around the state, the country, other countries, um, flare ups, pullbacks, um, politics versus public health. Um, and having gotten many, many comments, as, as do all my fellow board members, about what should happen, um, it was very clear to me that this is an incredibly polarizing issue and that parents, families are on just all, all along the continuum to staying home and virtually not going out to wanting 100% instruction to various, various issue, you know, various positions inside. And I, I really thought that, you know, sorry, uh, I really thought that since we cannot make a decision, a decision that will make everyone happy that giving people giving families choice what am i comfortable with for my children yeah. my own children i mean as a mother and a grandmother i thought that was a great um as as good as a response as we could get and um as this evolves on a day-to-day -day basis we are dealing with a lot of issues you know our public health metrics in this community are excellent they continue to be excellent despite the return of thousands of students and i certainly hope that that will continue as has been noted in emails from cornell the the infection rate in returning students is so far below what they expected it is it is absolutely amazing um, no one knew that two or three weeks ago. And, you know, in, in two or three weeks, if that's still the case, will people feel more secure? Um, we do certainly have an imbalance between the number of parents who want to send their kids to school and the number of teachers who feel comfortable being in school or who have reasons that they they can't be and that's something that we are absolutely trying to to address um but there are there are certainly other issues as well as far as what what health measures can be taken in various environments with with various age levels and i i for one am one of the you know, 
like all board members, we want all families who want their kids in school to be able to have that. And we are, we are working towards that as much as we can. Um, you know, and I look at, I look at many, many schools in different countries that, and different states that have opened and are closing again. Um, and I would prefer that we avoid that if we can. Anyone else wish to respond at this time before we move on? Um, if not, uh, Mara, go ahead. I, I'm not sure I can uh, add very much. Uh, I think uh, Pat and Aaron, um, what they had to say reflected a lot of my thinking. You know, as Pat said, uh, that, you know, when our district came up with the idea of um, giving families and teachers choice, I thought it was great. But as Pat also indicated, you know, we're living in a different reality than we were when that decision was made. Um, and so um, we, we are adapting and that's where innovation is happening, that our uh, reopening team is going to be meeting and uh, they're going to be considering all kinds of possibilities and it will be a lot of people who have a lot of perspectives and a lot of imagination and they are going to be exploring every possibility to do the best that we can to serve the needs of our community knowing that everybody will have to uh, nobody's going to get exactly what they want. <laughs> um, we would only even have a, a shot at a lot of people getting what they want if there were no pandemic. Um, but that's not where we are. Um, so, and I know, you know, there's ongoing uh, professional development happening right now. There's a lot of innovative thinking about uh, going on in that and then come uh, September 3rd and then into the following week when all of our staff are going to be engaged in, in uh, professional development, I expect a, a, an amazing amount of innovation to come out of that. And thank you, Melinda, for uh, speaking with us tonight. Hey, Melinda, this is, uh, Nicole. Um, I think I would add on to Aaron in terms of the sentiment that I'm not only thinking about my three my three kids that go to the school that are enrolled in our school district, but it's the responsibility of thinking about what's best for our thousands of other children. Um, and while doing that, we have to think about words like trust and fear and safety, which are all emotionally charged words that mean something different to all of us. So while the central administration and board are we're attempting to be transparent. We're being asked the same question in different ways and people want different answers. Um, so I think that makes giving people the answers that they want very challenging. And the fact that the wording that we're using, um, I think also, and I don't wanna make the assumption that all people, but I think most people believe in unions and with unions, there are contracts and we want to abide by those contracts um, that we have while also encouraging our staff to think about the whole entire picture and everyone that's being impacted by this, night, this nightmare that we're all living in, which is affecting us in different ways. Um, in terms of innovation, I think I would agree with you in terms of wanting to think out of the box in terms of what our kids are receiving in terms of education. Um, but public education has probably been ex in existence for four centuries. So in terms of trying to pivot that in a span of four months, um, it's not realistic. It's something that we're definitely thinking about long term. Um, but while we're all living in this state of fear, I don't think that most of us are being our most imaginative, radical, innovative selves. So I think that's something that we're working towards as I'm working full time for Cornell and taking care of my three kids. I know I'm definitely not doing my best work as I'm juggling so many different things. So I guess I'm asking you um, humbly for patience as we are 
battling this nightmare every day and things are changing every day and our children's needs are changing every day. Um, but I hear you and I validate your concerns and I think many of us feel the same ways and in terms of us all voting to delay the school opening, I think most of us on the board want to see schools opening, but if we don't have those teachers there to open the building, voting no wasn't going to change much in the end. Um, maybe it would have made the community feel more supported in the fact that we want to see our schools open, but in terms of the, the action, the real action that we all wanted to see, I don't think that all of us voting no or the majority voting no to that delay would have given you or your children what you need right now. So again, um, I thank you. Nicole, I'll support um, everything you just said. Uh, that makes, it, it sort of captures my feelings as well. Um, Mindy, the lack of transparency is something I've been hearing uh, for a couple weeks now, and uh, in my 12 years on the board, it's been the most um, repeated comment, which is um, ironic in many regards because it's an elected position that gains nothing. There's no pay. So the reason I give up 20 hours of my week uh, is for the good of the community. And so um, I think there are some things that just seem um, different because of one, we have to continue to remind ourselves that we are in a health pandemic. And while I say this to people and email repeatedly, while Tompkins County numbers may be low right now, it doesn't mean they will be low. And we're finding uh, school districts across the state, Syracuse, if I'm not mistaken, just announced that they're starting remotely. Um, the University of Alabama has had an explosion in terms of their positive cases. And so colleges across the country are finding um, that the reopening plans have not gone as they expected. With that being said, there are significant mitigating factors. Um, that's just the reality. As a board member, did I want schools to open? Without question. I got a five-year-old who most people will see here in a minute because she wants to paint my nails. And so to try to be at a board meeting when I'm supposed to have my nails painted is a difficult proposition. Does she do better in school? Absolutely. I am a horrible pre-K teacher. I've been saying it to my colleagues. Well, this year she would have been in kindergarten. So I'm a horrible teacher at that level. I understand that. So of course we want our babies to be in school. Of course we want our young folks to be in school. Our teachers are experts for a reason. As a faculty member in the Department of Education who trains pre-service teachers, there's a reason why they have a craft. There's a reason why they have a skill. Of course we want that. And I'm gonna continue to say that. And we are in uncharted territory of a health pandemic that we did not control. So why did we delay the opening? COVID-19, that's it. We can talk about any other mitigating factors, teachers, health professionals, our buildings. If we were not experiencing this, we would be open as normal. And to what Nicole said, yes. 1639 was the first public law written to collect tax dollars to educate children. We're trying to change a four century plan in four months and we're not doing it well. Let me add a couple quick other things. I'm watching restaurants, I'm watching businesses, I'm watching my friends suffer in this pandemic. Their businesses are not being, may not be able to recover because of what's taking place. So it's not just about schooling, it's about all colleagues that we know. I'm watching unions across the state recommend and or demand that they have a virtual opening at least until October 5th. We chose not to close schools for the semester, not to close schools or do virtual learning for the year, but to give ourselves to October 5th to put the best plan in place where hopefully you will see that innovation take place. And let me say it, Quite honestly, it will not happen without you. I have the privilege of knowing you and knowing your mind. Come join us, help us be innovative. That's what a community does. It is not one person, it is not a board, it is not a group of folks. It's a community that creates innovation that supports it to make it happen. And I know you asked that question, what can you do? And I'll get there in a second. Lastly, to Pat's point, my brother is in Shenzhen, China teaching. Half of his colleagues have not been able to return because of a re-increase uh, in COVID cases. So at one point in time, they were doing quite well. 
they closed, they opened their school, and now they're being asked to close their school again. The number of factors that are taking place here are so large and deep. None of us want to be in this position. None of us are in a position to gain anything by not having open and honest conversations. Our job is to try to think about what is in the best interest of young people, and we will continue to do that. So we'll be having another reopen team meeting, Dr. Brown, if I'm not mistaken, on September 1st, there'll be some invitations going out. We welcome any and all recommendations, ideas, suggestions on how to be the community that leads in this area. But if you know of any community that right now that has it or feels like they have it together, I'm telling you at day by day, there are more communities who are choosing a virtual reopening to make sure that they can have everything in place and we are doing the same. Does not feel good, but it's the reality. And I have faith that this community in particular will be able to survive that as long as we continue to have open and honest conversations. And to end, you can call me at any point in time. Uh, well, Mindy, your, uh, your one question uh, generated a fair amount of uh, responses, so uh, we appreciate it. It's a question that uh, really the community is asking, and so we appreciate that. I will only add that uh, I say many times, but uh, in the, we are at our best in this community and this district as a board when we are talking about the children's experience in the classroom and how we can make it better. And that will be our priority. Um, our job, our mission over the next, uh, well, it has always been, it's always a match up. Uh, our student needs with personnel, with staff. What do they need? What do, what do the parents' children need? What do Nicole's children need? They're, they're, they may have different needs. And so we as a district, we as a community meet those needs. And that was our mission. Um, and uh, Certainly, we are. I am adamant that uh, those the needs of the kids will be met, and certainly there will be. Um, we need to match up our resources with where the kids are, and that's uh, that's our job. Uh, we're going to hear more uh, later tonight uh, in just a few minutes about what we're doing within the buildings and uh, and uh, prepping for people to be in those buildings in a safe way. Um, we heard about it last week, but we're going to update uh, the community a bit about what's happening in the community outside of the ICSD and then also what we're doing within the ICSD and have been doing. Um, new protocols, new procedures, but uh, to make that experience better for the, for the folks in the, in the classroom and in the building. So thanks, Mindy. Appreciate it. Um, so for now, I think we need to go on with consent and we'll continue with our public meeting and we can go ahead and get a motion to approve the consent agenda and second and then we can discuss any items therein. I'll move the consent agenda. Thanks, Mark. Second. second. Thanks for jumping in, Pat. There you go. Uh, moving and seconded, uh, Emily, if you could call. Well, no, oops, sorry. Um, so if there are items on the consent agenda and Amanda, if you could speak to certainly a resolution 6.5 and anything else that uh, may be of interest and explanation for the board. 6.1 as well, Amanda, just so the community knows what we're doing with the tax warrant. Exactly. Great, so um, I can speak to the, I'll talk, speak to the tax warrant first, because I know that Dr. Brown is gonna be speaking a lot about um, the proposals that are on the cons uh, consideration of accounts for train, which is the uh, company that has analyzed and now is proposing for remediation of our ventilation systems throughout our buildings. Um, the tax warrant um, that is the, the essentially the board is authorizing us to uh, start the tax uh, bill process right so that we can get out to every single taxpayer um, calculate their taxes based on uh, the amount that their house is assessed at. Um, once again, this year, the tax rate is going down. So the levy amount is the total amount of taxes collected across the district's taxable value. Um, the tax rate is what does it mean to me as a taxpayer? 
what am I actually paying? The warrant doesn't speak to the rate, but the rate is really important, right? Because that comes closest to home for you. And so the tax rate, because we have a community that continues to grow and continues to have development, active development here in this community, that means that there are more shoulders to carry the burden of the tax levy, even if that goes up. Uh, so much so that as the levy increases, if the number of taxpayers and the tax base increases, we actually see a decrease in that tax rate to ourselves. So here in Ithaca City School District, our tax rate is going down, I believe it's about 25 cents from last year per $1,000 uh, of your assessed value of your home. Amanda, you mentioned we're going to talk about the um, various uh, agreements and improvements to ventilation, et cetera. Uh, the town to consent agenda, you said Dr. Brown's going to speak to it later, or are we voting on it and then going to dig into it? How do you want to handle that? Yeah, it's probably best. Um, we have some guests tonight. We were hoping to talk about reopening planning as one item. Um, and probably have that part be the last thing we talk about and have our guests go first, but um, whatever the board wishes, we can talk about it now but prior to a vote but, or talk about it later. Doc, I would appreciate a little brief um, notice sure. about what we're voting on prior to casting my vote. I mean, I, cool. from a facilities committee, yeah. I have an idea, but I think our board colleagues would benefit from just knowing a little bit more about what we're doing here. Sure. And Amanda, help me out here. Um, we're talking it's about $323,000 in remediation um, that the folks from train are helping uh, support us with. Um, overall, we, we're spending about $1.2 million in COVID-related uh, costs to upgrade and enhance facilities to be ready to open up on October the 5th. Um, that includes, you know, close to $29,000 in emerge filters. But the, and as part of the agenda, Amanda, correct me if I'm wrong, that $323,000 is for trains work to enhance our HVAC systems after doing their initial inspection and assessments of our work, correct? That is correct. So that's essentially, we, we paid for them to do the analysis, right, in one proposal. Mm -hmm. This is the follow-up proposal that actually now is for the remediation based on their analysis of all of our buildings. And those... And uh, the contract uh, is separated out into, it looks like about 12 different contracts, depending on the building. And so varying amounts and depending on the building and what was needed and whether it was a new compressors or coils or whatever, but it really is detailed in this list. But basically we're gonna go through multiple buildings and, uh, and fix and upgrade and improve, correct? That is correct. And you'll notice that there are a few buildings that are not listed in terms of remediation. We actually, that's because TRAIN has partnered with our facilities department. So when work can be done internally by our facilities department, like replacing belts, replacing motors, that's being done internally. And so again, this was very mindful of sort of the, the spending that we have for COVID, but also addressing it as quickly as possible, therefore having a very complete team. So that includes our facilities department, TRAIN, um, WCS is another group that we're working with, and then also um, another uh, contracted service that we did, uh, I think, a couple of meetings ago, which was J&K um, Heating and Ventilation, and they are also part of all of this. So, um, again, this is comprehensive, and we want to be efficient because we have sort of an eye on the opening plan date. Right, and, it's, uh, and it should be noted that the, uh, the work is to be completed by September 24th or in a, in a date in September, and that work in all those buildings will be completed by that time. So it is it's not extended, it's not a long process, but it is a, a targeted uh, approach to fix various systems in various buildings. So if, uh, if there's no other questions, we can just go ahead and uh, I just could I just have one other question. It's not really a question, but um, just to clarify, this is for ventilation, right? This by doing these improvements, it will improve the ventilation for our buildings in terms of dealing with the issues pertaining to COVID. Correct. That's, that's correct, and we want to bring in as much fresh air as possible, and then we also want to filter any air that is flowing through our buildings. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
right Anna and Amanda they see that's a good thing to do regardless of whether there is COVID or not or flu A and B or pollen in the air I mean right so it's just it's, it's something that needs to be done and should be done regardless obviously there's an incentive to do it at now but it is these are things that uh, you know are are and should be done uh, to the buildings just for everyday use and so you're seeing a higher higher level of scrutiny and make ensuring systems are working as they are supposed to and so that's an ongoing process throughout the district um, and what this is uh, items that we will take care of at this time any other questions if not uh, agenda consent agenda has been moved seconded and Emily if we could uh, call the roll Bob Ainsley yes Aaron Croyle yes Sean Eversley Bradwell yes Eldred Harris Nicole LaFave? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Ann Reichlin? Yes. Patricia Wazalou? Yes. Very good. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone. And Dr. Brown, I believe we are, we are ready to move on. And to your, uh, your report and uh, school district business, which I assume is reopened. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Bainsley. And I do want wish to get to school district business. And for my report, um, just one item. I, uh, our community lost an equity warrior. Our oh. community lost an equity warrior. I just want to wish to take this opportunity to um, share with some and uh, to reiterate to others. You know, we lost Kirby Edmonds last weekend. And Kirby has done much for this community, our school district, and for me personally. Um, Eric Kirby was a member of the Equity and Inclusion Leadership Council, um, has, has done much to put us in this position where we are having conversations about equity and anti-racism and excellence for all young people. Um, and I could go on and on about how great of a person he was, but I just wanted to make sure folks knew that, the board knew that, and to express my, um, my condolences to the family and to note in this space right now um, that he, he, he did much for that. He, he's leaving a legacy um, in this community and in our school district. So, and, I, and so there's no good way to transition from that, but I, I, we, we've invited some other folks who, who are doing much to support our school district and uh, leaving their mark on us in all the work that we do. I've said often that I can't think of any initiative or anything that we do that isn't connected to Cornell University. And our partnership is critical to the excellence and the equity that we do here. So we've invited, as we are talking about reopening our spaces to, in an innovative way and in a safe way, um, we've been partnering with our friends at Cornell, and I've invited uh, Mike Kokolov, the, the pro provost, and Joe Molina, uh, VP, to come share some things that are happening at Cornell as they look to reopen their campus um, in a safe way and how they're supporting our community and our school district. So, uh, Mike, Joel, if you wish to share some things, and I know the board has some questions for you, and then when we're done with you, we're going to transition to another friend who's joining us this evening to talk about um how to support our community in this time so with that joel am i right thank you very much uh lavelle i'm just gonna talk very briefly then hand it over to mike i want to first return the the thanks uh lavelle you are uh, an incredibly important partner we value our interactions um the role you played even today as we released a, a video welcoming back our students featuring local leaders such an important element in our efforts to make sure our students, as they come back, recognize that their behaviors, it's not just an impact on the Cornell community, but it's our entire greater community. And, and certainly the discussion that you all just had um, referenced the fact that our reopening plans uh, and the progress of our efforts has a direct impact on the decisions that the school board needs to make. And so we had reached out to Lavelle uh, last week to see whether there might be interest among the board for us to briefly uh, talk about our approach to reopening and, and where we are in that process. Um, so I wanna thank uh, Rob and the rest of the board for this opportunity. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Kotlikoff, our provost. Mike will spend maybe five, 10 minutes talking about our plan and then we'd love to take your questions, Mike. 
Sure. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Lavelle. And uh, thank you, board members, for everything you're doing for Ithaca and our students. Um, both of my kids graduated from Winthrop Boynton and Ithaca High School, and uh, just a fabulous experience. So let me just say a couple of things. I don't have any planned remarks, but I'm, I'm um, perhaps give a little perspective from what uh, Cornell is doing. And I'm hearing some echoes in the um, challenges that you're facing in terms of reopening. We uh, decided very shortly after closing in March that we needed to prepare and be ready to be able to make a decision uh, about reopening. That would require us building some capacity to do some things to reopen safely. So we were able to anticipate the need, um, assuming that we would not have a vaccine for the virus, uh, to be able to surveil our populations of students returning and, um, and try and see if we could mount a successful semester in person. Um, that led me to recruit a uh, remarkable epidemiologist at, at uh, Cornell to pull a team together to start modeling what this would look like. And we knew very, very early that we, we really had a challenge because if we opened, we had a challenge having students come back and living in our dorms. But if we didn't open, we also had an enormous challenge because we knew that uh, Cornell, more than 50% of our students live off campus. They had leases. They'd already signed their leases, and we knew many of them were coming back. We, we surveyed them, and we found out what we thought, which was many of them did plan to come back, whether we were open or not. And um, then we were faced with trying to understand how to, how to control that situation. And so let me just say that we've got a, um, a plan that I sort of call nested safety barriers. The first thing is uh, really this surveillance testing, testing individuals on the way in. So um, trying to understand who's coming into this very low prevalence community, our remarkable community where we've had very few cases, who's coming in with, um, with the virus, isolating those individuals very quickly, getting them out, and then constantly testing our community to make sure that anybody that we missed or any virus that emerges through other contacts doesn't spread, doesn't um, create this community spread that we all want to avoid. So the first thing is this testing program. And we were fortunate enough to have a, a diagnostic lab at the veterinary college that's used to doing high throughput surveillance. And we build a new lab and we're able now to do 50,000 tests a week to be able to, um, to surveil our, our entire population. Um, but we also knew that we would have to have behavioral modifications. So we would need to have mask wearing and physical distancing. We know from the science, if you do those two things, even if someone, even if we miss someone and someone is infected and near you, the likelihood if you have a mask and you're less than 15 minutes within six feet of that individual, the likelihood is very, very low of transmitting the virus. Um, but we also modified our facilities, as you've talked about, put in filters, um, changed our classroom so we would have safe distancing between students and um, put in travel restrictions and a campaign really around that Joel has mounted around sending the message that this is a community effort to try and do something that's extraordinarily difficult, but something that we think we can pull together as a community. And it is a community effort. We've had really a marvelous collaboration with Cuga Health System, Marty Stallone and his team, with Tompkins County, with Frank Krupa, um, and, and uh, really all thought together about how we might make this work. Now, as, as I think uh, Pat said, um, one of the things that we've seen now, we've tested over 13,000 students coming in and we have well below 0.1% prevalence. That's one in a thousand. So that's less than 13 students. In fact, it's 10 now um, students that have come back with virus. Um, that is an order of magnitude lower than what we had estimated we would be facing 
and could handle when students came in. We had estimated 2% for students coming back. Many of you may know that was the finding for West Point when their cadets came back for graduation. They had about 2% of those individuals, all asymptomatic, no signs, about 2% harbored the virus. We're a, an order of magnitude and more below that. We also had assumed 4% from the quarantine states, so even higher, and we're not seeing any place near that. So, so far so good. We're not being complacent. Um, we released today a, um, a dashboard that will give the community clear ideas about where we are at all times. Um, we, are, we, that dashboard includes an alert system that tells the community what the status of our operations are. And that status depends on, one, the numbers of infections that we're seeing on an ongoing basis, two, the capacity of our health system. So with Fuga Health, we've, we monitor on a daily basis. We have a meeting every day. Uh, Joel and I just got off of this 5.30 meeting where we look at all the data with Marty Stallone, Stallone from Fuga Health. Um, what is our capacity in terms of ICU rooms, ventilators, patients under, under um, a care, uh, all those things to make sure that we don't compromise uh, our community health. Third, what's our status for uh, quarantine and isolation? Are we able, we have enough capacity to get these individuals out of the circulation to be able to um, maintain a safe community? And then finally, the status of our testing program is everything working? Do we have supplies? Do we have a month uh, ahead of supplies for that testing program, which is critical? Let me say two other things. One is about the testing, which is, um, and, and I've said, and I was reported in the press, that um, we've decided that our shutdown signal, or, or, or one of the things that would make us consider shutting down, would be 250 new cases in a week. And I got a number of emails saying, what are you, crazy, 250 in a week? We only have had a little more than 200 in Tompkins County since, since March. The, the thing that I want to point out is that we're testing asymptomatic people. We're testing everybody. We haven't done that in Tompkins County. The estimates are that five to tenfold uh, of the number that are identified by symptoms are actually infected, don't get symptomatic, and spread the virus. So we will see more cases. We will absolutely see more cases. But we will, that's the point. If we see those cases, we can get them out of circulation. We can keep them from spreading that to the community. Now, I, I think um, I, I heard somebody mention other universities um, in trouble and closing down. And I just want to point out a significant thing. Again, without pride of ownership or hubris, but we're doing something different than UNC or Notre Dame. UNC tested 365 students out of a population of 30,000 undergrads in their first week of operation. We're testing 50,000. They only tested individuals that were symptomatic. That resulted in not identifying people that were asymptomatic, harboring the virus, those individuals had the kinds of interactions that were not controlled, and that caused them to shut down. UNC, very similar. You will hear of more universities that get into that position. I, I will predict, because they haven't set up what Cornell has set up. I'm, I am very proud of that. But having said that, we're also, uh, I'm, I'm very willing, and Martha is, is keyed uh, on the fact that if things change, we will change. And if we need to shut down, if we need to go to yellow, orange, red, we will stop our operations and assure or ensure the community safety. Final point. Um, I've, I've heard tonight a little bit about choice amongst faculty. We had the same issue at Cornell. We provided our faculty with a choice as to whether to teach in the classroom or not. First of all, we went through all the issues around how we would assure their safety. No one would be within six feet of a student or anyone else. Uh, everyone would be wearing masks. We would um, configure our rooms, et cetera. So we, we um, set up the situation in which the likelihood of infection is very, very low. 
Having provided those insure, that assurance, our faculty have stepped up. Almost 40% of our classes will be person to person. This is entirely voluntary by the faculty. They can teach online if they'd like. They've chosen to try and create uh, the best kind of experience for our students. We also have faculty that are living with students in our dorms, faculty and residents, graduate students and res residents. You've heard about some of that, some of the discom discomfort and fear. Um, somebody mentioned here the, um, um, the polarizing nature of this conversation. And we've had some of that as well. And, and some, some individuals, it, it doesn't matter what the science is, what the plans are, there's a lot of fear. And we recognize that and we thought it was important to say to individuals, if this is not for you, if you can't do it, um, you know, we're, we're not gonna put you in a position where you're so in stress, so stressed that it's gonna affect your health in another way. So I think this has worked out. It's worked out collaboratively with the faculty, um, but all of that is so far. We're in the beginning of, a, of, a, of an effort to try and create a semester of value for our students. And uh, we're monitoring that, as I say, on a daily basis. We will continue to do that. We'll be transparent about it. And uh, the only th the final thing I would say is, is um, I, I will give the community my guarantee that should things change, Cornell will change and we will not um, do anything that puts at risk this, this um, uh, precious community. So with that, I think Joel and I would be glad to take any questions if you have any. Uh, um, I, I know I've covered only a little bit of this story. Um, I, I have a question, this is Anne. Um, you mentioned, and I apologize if you already answered this, but you mentioned that you tested all the students as they came into the community. So are you continuing, how often are you testing the students yeah. who are asymptomatic now that they're on campus and will you do the same for those that are off campus? Yes, so the plan is to, uh, to test every undergraduate twice a week. Every faculty member and graduate student who is student facing um, teaching in the classroom twice a week. Um, if you're um, um, a faculty in residence, for example, your family as well, your kids, as well, twice a week. Then there are faculty who are coming to campus less often. Um, they can choose once a week or twice a week, uh, once a week or every other week, depending on how, how, um, what their level of contact is. And then we got a lot of emails from people who said, I live off campus, I'm not coming to campus. This is faculty, staff, and graduate students. You want me to take a TCAT bus and come into campus, I'm more exposed to get tested than I would be if I were staying in my room. And so we're allowing people to opt out from testing entirely if they're not coming to campus. The key that we had here was to, the, 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 the key is to get into campus, you need to participate in this testing program. That keeps us all safe. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Um, I have a question because a lot of people are asking us about surveillance testing for our faculty and staff and students. Now, my understanding that the guidelines from the CDC was not rec uh, recommending that school districts like us do that kind of testing. And there would be enormous challenges to it, but I, it might be helpful for people to know. Like, uh, so you're doing, 50,000 uh, tests a week. Um, what is this costing Cornell to do this? Yeah, so, so um, we are pool testing. So let me, let me go back a little bit and talk about the CDC uh, recommendation and guidelines. The CDC did want, not want to, um, you know, we do not have enough diagnostic tests for the US population. They did not want to expend those tests on individuals that are asymptomatic because we weren't covering the full symptomatic range in many places. That was the nature of the CDC recommendation. What we decided to do early on was to mount surveillance testing, which is different than diagnostic testing, and we're pooling. So um, we started, I began talking to New York State Health and the FDA, had a number of conversations 
with Dr. Deborah Burks and people at, at um, the CMS about how we might do this in a way in which we would not uh, do it at the expense of the diagnostic testing that's that's precious. And so we've mounted that 50,000. So that's pooled uh, pools of five. And so we're actually doing 10,000 tests a week, a little over like 1,500 a, uh, um, uh, a day of individual tests with pools of five. And that's a surveillance process that allows us then to do the final test with Cuga Medical as a diagnostic test. So now you, any of those pools that are, um, that are negative, you don't have to retest again. And of those 1,500 that we do every day, maybe there's 10 or 15 that are positive pools at the most. And then we test the five, those five times 10 or 15 in, in a diagnostic fashion, adding very little burden to our diagnostic testing. And that's the final test that we inform the county and say, um, you're positive. So we've, we've, this is new testing capacity. I frankly wish others had done this. Some other schools are doing it. We're not the only ones, but it, it, um, uh, it, it provides a capacity and, a, and efficiency. Now, we're also hoping, and I've talked to Lavelle about this, we're, we have another parallel system where we have a faculty member, an RNA expert, who is working on expanding this pooling, not to five, but to 24. And that would market, markedly increase our capacity. And I would love to be able to provide some of that capacity to uh, the Ithaca School District. Um, it's something Lavelle and I have talked about a little bit. We're not in a position now. We're very working very hard. I think um, sometime in the next months to two months, we may well be in a position where we can say we can do some pool surveillance for you in an efficient way without anything near the cost of what you're seeing for diagnostic testing, which is 100 to $150 a, a test. So you, you asked me, I want to be transparent. You asked me what where Cornell is paying for this testing. Our estimates overall are it's going to, to be between five and $10 million over the course of the year that we'll expend for testing. Dr. Kotlikoff, I want to thank you for sharing. This is Sean Eversley Bradwell. Um, uh, I'm the person that mentioned what other institutions are doing, and I'm very proud of, uh, as an alum of Cornell, to see that we are doing things differently. That part I understand. With that being said, I am also repeatedly, as I'm sure some of my colleagues are, getting photos or emails of what is presumably, right, not definitively, right, but yeah. Yeah. presumably Cornell students, and as a faculty member I see, I get the same thing of, of IC folk. And so yeah. I'm wondering if there are suggestions that you have for us as um, board members, when community members write to us about presumably, again, I wanna make sure I'm clear about this, yeah. um, Cornell students using ICSD facilities in large groups, right? If there are things that, and I know that there is a contract that students are asked to sign. Um, and I know we don't have this sort of same sort of system in community hangouts that UT Austin does or University of Alabama, but just asking if there's things that you would recommend that we would move forward with in collaboration. Yeah, there's, um, Sean, there's a little bit more heat than light in some of these comments. We, we have had some isolated incidents. You know, I, I get emails from people that say, you idiot, I saw somebody in Bell Sherman without a mask. You're crazy, you know, shut it down. Um, the, the reality is we have had some incidents. There's a noted TikTok um, video of some people. They've been very minor. And believe me, there has been very significant pushback on those individuals from other students. Um, so much so that we're worried about uh, some of those individuals because they've, uh, they themselves have felt enormous social peer pressure about what they've done. I'm, I'm really hopeful. Now, you know, having said that, uh, I'm the last person that would say I, I can control the behavior of every 19 to 23 year old. Um, and, and colleges are about interactions and, and, uh, and that. And um, uh, we, we are sending every message that we possibly can 
But again, we are not simply relying on compliance by 19 to 22 and 23 year olds. We are enforcing it. We will come down hard on it. We are sending all the messages that we can about it, but we're also testing them and they have to be tested twice a week. And if I can add just one thing, um, we are going to be co uh, concurrent with the start of the semester next week. Um, there will be an online reporting tool. We want all members of the community to be able, if they observe something, to report something to our compact compliance team. Um, so this is not something we're telling the community we'll take care of it. We want to hear from you. So that'll be something we'll be spreading that, uh, uh, that link around once it's live. It'll be on our COVID website, covid.cornell.edu. And to that point, we also have 100 um, staff, a lot of, lot of coaches that are not, not coaching right now, circulating around, enforcing. We have 300 students, peer-to-peer -peer monitors that are going around also through College Town, et cetera. So we've, we've put in place a significant uh, a system of monitoring. Uh, Doctor and Jill, this is Eldred. How are you two doing? Thank I'm you very well, us. thank you, Eldred. Good to see you, Jill, in, in person, well, in pseudo person. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Dr. Kornikoff, here's my question, and I guess it's for Jill as well. Because we're a community, the decisions we make affect you and vice versa. I'm wondering if you have a sense of how many of your faculty and staff have said they would like to come back to you, but they're finding it difficult because of the decisions that we're making, right? Yeah. Whether we're making it because of teachers or because of whatever our limitations are. I'm just curious, do you have any sense of how, um, what kind of issue we're dealing with here? Yeah, I mean, there is a great, I get a lot of faculty emails uh, from individuals that um, really want the school district to open and ask me what we can do. Can we, uh, can we help with testing? How can we help? Um, and and um, it's, it's both, you know, uh, personal in terms of their own kids and making progress, but it's also about the community. And uh, so we are hearing that. Um, I don't presume to make choices for you all. And, and I know you've got really, really tough decisions. So I've, I've tried to simply stay out of this and say uh, to Lavelle and others, can, can, we, can we help? If there's anything we can do to, to help, we're, we'd love to think about it and see if, if it's possible. And, and even further than that, I mean, one of the things, one of the individuals uh, Jeff Pleiss, who's, who's working very hard on, on um, trying to expand our capacity and do this more efficiently and much cheaper. Um, he's got kids in the school system and part of his motivation is getting them back and helping out. Nothing like self-interest to move the change. Thanks. Absolutely. And, and I just want to add my gratitude that you are trying to get surveillance testing into the district um, we've had we've had teachers want that we've had parents want that currently um, it would be impossible for us to provide that both financially and in practical terms I think I think Andrew Cuomo said every district should do testing but of course gave us no money or resources not that he has any to give and I think this is critical and I really applaud um, your efforts, um, really so proud of Cornell that they have instituted this, this testing program. Well, I do also want to be deferential to Lavelle. I know we've talked a little bit. There are some legal issues for the school district around testing as well. And we've, you, you know, it's a, it's a difficult landscape to navigate, um, but, but we would love to be able to be helpful if it's possible. Gentlemen, the um, the point I would uh, I would I would make, and really, it's um, as a, as another Cornell grad on the board, but uh, it's uh, Cornell coming out and and really fighting against the the tide a bit, and um, and it was that counterintuitive, um, you know, the students are here already, and the students are going to be here whether we're remote or not. 
And, um, and I think that's a, certainly is a, it was a different tack. And, uh, and setting up a, a robust protocol for testing uh, is certainly, um, I've seen the list, I've seen what, uh, what you will be doing going forward. But really, the realization and bowing to reality that um, Ithaca is a great place to be. And students were really, they've been coming in all summer and we've been seeing them certainly at the college going out students, they've been here. Um, their apartments, they rented their apartments. And so uh, you're really bringing them into the system instead of trying to um, just shut down and, and, not, and not doing what you're doing. And so that's key. And my point has been all, certainly all along, it is Cornell realizing that students are here and we need to we need to work with within the system and within our community. Students are a huge part of it, and um, and we need to make it work. And so, in the same way, I, I try to point out that um, you know your students come in from essentially every every state in the union, uh, and you're doing a great job of integrating them. Um, our students are here; they've been here. There's a realization that reality is that our students are here, our families are here. We interact. Um, Mike, you're, Michael, you're, um, you know, your kids went to Ithaca High. I mean, there's uh, how many, um, you know, there's a lot of staff, the kids are integrated in our school system. The kids are interacting, the professors, kids, et cetera. That's, that's Ithaca, that's the public education system in Ithaca, New York. Um, so we're, we should be able to figure out how we can have similar as with Cornell, but have in-person instruction and also that distance learning model. But again, the best, the best way forward is to bow to reality and understand that uh, we've been interacting all summer. We've been interacting since last March. When I, um, on March 13th, when I, uh, I drove up to the airport essentially for our news conference that said we were going to shut down on March 13th, I drove past uh, the athletic field that Ithaca High, there are hundreds of kids playing lacrosse and spring sports. And I just came from concert where uh, orchestra, band, hundreds of kids were worked together really in the height of, um, of that, of the COVID-19 taking off. And um, that was, now we have many structures in place, protocols in place. Obviously Cornell, you are doing what you're doing. I think a college made their, their decisions. Um, I know for a fact there's many I think the college students are not going anywhere. They're still going to be here. Um, so we, uh, you know, we just need to ensure the community that, uh, you know, we're working together with Cornell and Ithaca College. Um, and we're going to be able to provide you know, an outstanding in-person educational experience for our students. If, parents want it, frankly, kids want it. Um, and also we'll meet also that distance learning 3.0. It's still not gonna be, frankly, as good as, as you all know, uh, that in-person experience with the teacher. So we, were, we are gonna continue to work forward to make that happen. Um, and it is great to hear tonight uh, all that Cornell is doing. Um, and I, uh, I look forward to the collaboration of the community, collaboration with Cornell uh, yet again, and uh, whatever whatever we can do to ensure that Cornell employees have have the, the knowledge and understanding and consideration of the school district that their kids are going to be okay going to going to school and coming home and then interacting with that professor or staff person that has been in uh, on camp Cornell's campus. And that interaction is going to be in a safe, uh, safe way as well, as safe as possible. But it's a we uh, we live in a great place. Our you know our hospitals are are ready for anything, but they are they are have been uh, unused basically. And so we, if we continue to do what we do, then we can ensure that uh, folks are going to get through this as we work through the fall, work into next spring, and um, the idea of 
a distance learning model being a, the only choice is frankly unacceptable and that, uh, that we need to make this happen, uh, Dr. Brown, which we talk about every now and then, Dr. Brown. But, uh, but it's, that's what we do in Ithaca, that's ICSD, that's the Ithaca City School District, been doing this for a long time. Uh, we, um, we don't have to look for other solutions, other choices, you know, we will figure it out here. As I say all the time, if we can't figure this out, I'm not sure who can. Um, so we, uh, we, we as a community are going to make this happen and, um, and get folks where they need to be, get the kids where they need to be, and the experience that they deserve. Was that too long, Dr. Brown? Can I stop talking now? Is that good? No, sir. You, it's, it's your meeting, uh, Mr. President. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but I do wish to transition. Um, Joel and Mike have been on for a long time, and I wish to say thank you for your partnership and collaboration. And I look forward to having a Zoom call in the near future with you, <laughs> with you again. So uh, sure. good to see you all. Thank you. Great to thank see you. you. It's our, uh, our pleasure. Be well. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah. Thank you all. And, you know, uh, speaking of Cornell, uh, we have another a Cornell grad um, who I wish to uh, ask to speak next, Dr. Snedeker, I mean, a, a community leader and a pediatrician. And he's been working with us quite a bit as well over the last month or so as we've been thinking about our reopening planning. So Dr. Snedeker, I wish to share, uh, have you shared some of your thinking? And uh, the board will have some questions for you as well. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, I know we're running a little bit behind, but I appreciate your patience. Yeah. That, no, that's okay. It's my pleasure. And thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be available to you. Um, I don't have any prepared remarks and my unprepared remarks will be considerably less than 40 minutes long. So um, uh, I, I don't really have an agenda here at all. Um, I, my position is I'm, I've been a pediatrician in the community for 25 years. Um, I'm also board certified in pediatric infectious diseases and I serve on the Infectious Diseases Subboard of the American Board of Pediatrics, which is the agency that certifies pedi pediatricians nationally. Um, I'm a former president of the um, Board of Cuga Medical Center and also the Tompkins County Health Department. So I, I, I have a lot of um, infectious disease experience and um, I'm also a parent of uh, a proud parent of a former um, Ithaca City School District graduate. Um, and I have also a lot of patients in the district, as I'm sure you all know, um, who are um, itching to get back into school in many cases, although um, I will admit that there are exceptions. Um, so um, my, what I would like to do is simply make myself available for questions and particularly questions um, either about the pediatric aspects of kids being in school or not being in school and also about the epidemiology of COVID, you know, sort of where we are now, where we may be going, how long are, are we going to be dealing with this, um, and, uh, you know, questions about the biology of the virus as it pertains to the school environment. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, field any or all of that or anything else that comes to mind that perhaps my experience could be helpful with. Uh, I've been asking questions for the last month. Thank you. <laughs> I bet you have, Dr. Snedeker. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Del Um There's a question I brought from my colleagues and our uh, medical professionals who are excellent, but since we have you, I'll ask you as well. Um, the conversation we've been having about why people may be choosing not to return or maybe choosing to be resistant to returning in person, seems to fall into two large camps. One is the safety of their children, and the other one is the teachers and staff wanted to make sure that the district is doing everything we can possibly do to ensure the safety of both of those groups. Regarding the safety of children, can you assure us or help us work through the epidemiology of the, um, how the infection plays out in youth. And give us a cutoff point. I've been hearing some things about children being safer, but children to us goes up to 18. What's the actual math? What's the actual science behind how this virus is playing out in youth populations? Sure. 
Well, I, I, won't, I won't bore you with a lot of numbers, but um, I, I'll, I'll speak in general terms to that. Um, the first is that uh, contrary to what you may have heard some public officials say, children are not immune to COVID. Um, they can get this virus just like everybody else can. Um, as a rule, children tend to have milder symptoms than adults. Um, and that's true across almost all age ranges. Um, when you start getting down to kids under one, um, that may start to break down a little bit, but by and large children in preschool age and children of school age, um, most children who get COVID are either not going to get symptoms at all or are going to get symptoms that are relatively mild. Um, they'll, they'll get congestion, they'll get cough, they may get fever. Um, a very small per percentage of children nationally, and this is true not only in our country, but in China and in Italy and many of the other places that have had um, heavy burden of COVID illness. Um, the percentage of children that wind up being hospitalized is actually very, very small. Um, you know, in, in, in the vicinity of 1% of recognized cases, which is probably a much smaller percentage of total cases. Um, and most of the children that have a difficult time with this virus have underlying medical conditions that predispose them to it. That, that is not universally true, um, but it is true of the majority. Um, so children that have chronic respiratory disease, children who have um, profound immune suppression, um, children who have obesity and, hy and hypertension and things like that um, may be at higher risk for higher risk for complications, but the vast majority do well. And even among children who are hospitalized, um, the mortality rate is extremely low. So the vast majority of children who get this illness survive it um, and, and do better than their adult counterparts. Now, some of you probably heard um, a couple of months ago prominently in the news about a uh, multi-inflammatory disorder, MISC, um, associated with, with COVID-19. And um, that is a real thing. Um, it's, it's a very uh, scary disorder for pediatricians because kids who get this get quite ill. Um, it tends to occur not in the beginning of the COVID illness, but, but after recovery. Um, typically about uh, the best estimates are three to four weeks after a child is exposed to COVID, maybe when this happens. We have no idea what's different about these children compared to other children because there, there haven't really been any identified risk factors for it. Um, but the good news that is that this is um, an even smaller percentage of children who are infected with COVID who develop this disorder. And even among children who get as sick as this, and this disorder can affect the heart and the kidneys and um, you know, put, put kids in intensive care units, um, the mortality rate is still somewhere in the vicinity of two to 3%, even of kids who get this. And my, my back of the envelope calculation is that perhaps one in three to 4,000 of children who have recognized COVID illness may develop this disorder. And again, if, if that's the tip of the iceberg, then the percentage of kids who get COVID who get this disorder is probably in order of magnitude lower than that. Um, when this disorder was first reported um, out of New York City, um, they reported about 100 cases um, at a time when they probably had, based on epidemiology, epidemiologic um, studies in New York City at that time, my guesstimate would be about 300 to 400,000 children who had had COVID at that particular point in time. And so um, the, if, you, if you do the math back from that, if every kid in Tompkins County got COVID tomorrow, we might see perhaps um, somewhere between six and 10 cases of this disorder about a month later. Uh, just to sort of put that in perspective as to um, how a rare thing it probably is. Thank you. Doctor, you um, certainly have a lot of experience on um, COVID-19 and, and that aspect. Do you care to discuss or to speak to well, the, the impact of ch on children or being isolated at home or not, not going to school and all the other factors that uh, can affect children's development. Sure. Um, it, it is important to say that, you know, keeping kids out of school has safety implications also. Um, some of those implications have to do with um, mental health and well-being. Um, I'm certainly seeing in my practice a lot more kids who have 
um, depressive symptoms and symptoms of anxiety from being out of school. Um, I have also some kids who have anxiety about being in school and they're delighted. Um, <laughs> they, they couldn't be happier. Uh, but but the number of those is pretty small, I think, compared to the kids that are really, um, you know, they're, they're, they are isolated from their social circles, they're missing their friends, they're missing the structure of the school environment. Um, they, they didn't feel like they were learning well in the remote learning environment, and they're not happy with facing, um, facing more of that. Um, I've had some kids actually that are far more anxious in the remote learning environment than they are in the school environment because they feel like in the remote environment when they're on screen, everybody's looking at them and judging them and they can be more anonymous in the classroom. Um, so so that, that's an important consideration. Um, many kids in our community sadly get most of their nutrition in school. Um, and it's also a safe environment for them to be in that may be safer than their home environment in some ways. Um, it, it's also a safe place for them to be when their parents are working and, and many of our parents don't have a choice about whether they can work or not and many more many of them are leaving their kids in circumstances at home that are less safe than one would like um, so there, there are lots of implications like that um, that are um, in addition to whatever impact on on learning happens um, that uh, that occur when kids are, are kept out of the school environment. So the, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as I suspect most of you know, made a fairly strong statement um, a couple of months back that, that you know, schools should make every effort to reopen, provided that they could do so safely. And one key element of that statement that was largely ignored when it was um, used for political purposes is that that assumes that virus rates in the community are low. That, that, that's the bedrock for that decision. You, know, you, you, you can't start to talk about reopening schools until you can assure that virus rates are low enough in the community that you can begin to think about them being low enough in the school to be able to keep the schools open safely. Um, so if we were talking about this in one of the states where the pandemic is currently much more active than it is here, we, we couldn't be having any of these discussions realistically. And, and the, the National Organization of, Pedi of Pediatricians has not said that schools should open under any circumstances whatsoever. Um, but I think, it, I think there is a compelling case for saying that if there, if there is a way that the schools can be open and um, that transmission can be limited, um, it can never be eliminated, presumably, but can be limited, um, that um, it is in the best interest of children, for the most part, to do so. Dr. Dr. Snedeker, oh, I'll wait. Oh, oh okay, thank you. Sure. Um, doctor, I, I thank you for this, and um, this. I think uh, kids going back to school will help parents' mental health <laughs> as well. Um, but you know, when we talk about transmission, you know, we have a lot of staff and teachers who are scared for their health. And so, you know, we're getting mixed messages because the virus is so new. Can you talk to us about kids spreading the virus to teachers and staff and adults and keeping in mind a lot of the students having issues with keeping masks on and them being kids by nature? Sure. So I think, you know, ensuring the safe environment, not only for students, but for teachers depends on having lots of different layers of protection. Uh, because as you point out, um, any, any single intervention can be defeated. So, you know, not, not every kid can wear a mask. Not every kid is going to perform really good hygiene. Um, some kids have difficulty um, keeping appropriate distances and so forth. So, um, you know, you, you have to have enough measures in place that the, the aggregate of all of those things provides you with a level of protection that you can't get from, from any of them individually. Um, it's no doubt, I'm, I, I, don't, I have no idea what the, um, you know, health conditions of the teacher population of ICSD is, uh, but I think it's safe to assume that there are teachers who are elderly, there are teachers who have obesity and hypertension and diabetes and immune system issues um, that put them at higher risk for, for um, illness should they get it. Um, so that, that's why it, it is so important that um, infection rates in the school um, not get higher than they are in the community. I mean, I, I think you know, that, that, that really can be the goal. I, I don't think we can expect that the rates in the school will be lower than the community, but in, 
in most places around the country, most places around the world, the school rates have really reflected the community rates. Um, it has not really often been the case that the school has been the place where the virus has entered and then spread to the community from there. Um, there are some places where that did happen. Uh, um, Israel is probably an example of that where they opened the schools without appropriate protections and the schools really were the place where the virus spread first and then got to the community. And you know, we all know from our previous experience that um, things like influenza and other respiratory illnesses, um, the schools are an important means of spreading those around and then getting them, getting them into the community. Um, I think with all the measures that are being put in place, we can anticipate that many of those will probably go down this year um, if we are doing better hygiene and, and keeping distance and wearing masks and so forth. Uh, but you're right, there, there, there is no one measure that is going to be perfect. And so um, in addition to things like masks and hand hygiene and distancing, um, there also has to be you know, smaller classroom numbers, um, teachers who are at high risk of being exposed and may have health conditions should be wearing appropriate protective equipment that should be available to them. Um, good air circulation is important, good ventilation. Um, and then also close monitoring. Um, we're fortunate that we have relatively ro robust monitoring in the community in terms of our testing rates, um, that it is likely that we will be able to recognize when numbers start to go up before disease is widespread, and that, that's really critical. Um, we don't have the sort of surveillance that Cornell has, and we're not going to. Um, there isn't any way to achieve that at the moment. Um, but we're still, you know, we're still doing um, you know, th thousands of tests a week in the community. Um, you know, 500 to 1,000 tests a day are happening at the, um, uh, uh, according to the health department. And um, the rates have remained low really since March. I mean, with the exception of two weeks after the 4th of July, where there was a little blip from, uh, you know, some folks who didn't do what they should have done. Um, our community rates have been static for a very, very long time. Uh, and if Cornell is able to succeed in what they are doing in preventing that being a new means of introducing virus into the community, um, there's no reason to think that our community rates are apt to change very much, at least in the short term. But I think it's critical that we keep monitoring so that we recognize if that does happen and can take appropriate action quickly. And did you have a question? Yeah, yeah it's kind of actually it was pretty similar to Aaron's. Um, and it sounds actually from what you were just saying that having multiple systems in place um, so that no one system is responsible for everything um, is what, you know, so that it's masks and hygiene and all these different protocols. Um, and so that is what I'm getting from you. And I guess my question is what would it take if you had a child that was of school age for you to feel comfortable sending your child to school? Sure, um, I don't, so I can answer freely and nobody can hold me accountable to that. Um, <laughs> but um, what I can say is that um, I have been very impressed with the amount of work that the school district has been done to create an environment that should be safe for a reopening. Um, but as I said earlier, first and foremost, it would be low community rates. I mean, it, you know, if, if we were if we were having you know 50 positive cases in the county a week, um, no matter what you're doing in school, um, you're not going to be able to keep it under control. Um, and you know, if we were sitting in Onondaga County, where right now they're having 100 cases a week, and it's a much bigger county, obviously, um, but that's about what they're having in Onondaga County right now. Um, I don't think that would be safe for a reopening environment, but I think it, you know, get, given the low community rates, um, the, the, you know, you, you can do the math and figure out what percentage of kids are apt to walk into school being infected with COVID in the absence of any surveillance. And then you're adding on top of that pre-screening for symptoms or exposure. You're adding on top of that um, symptoms for exclusion. You're adding on top of that distancing and masking and uh, making hand hygiene more available and having smaller numbers of kids in school than we normally do and cohorting if possible. You know, e each of those things adds 
um, you know, I, and, and I can't tell you for each one, whether it's a 50% reduction or a 90% reduction, we just don't have that sort of hard data on those things. But what I can tell you is that the effect of each measure like that, that you introduce multiplies the benefit and further reduces the risk. Great, thanks. Sean. No, that and I, I guess it, 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 if I, and if I could just add one more thing before I answer your question, Sean. Um, you know, I think it's important, it's really important to understand that we are in this for the long haul. Um, and anybody who thinks that three months from now we're going to be in a, a much better situation or six months from now we're going to be in a much better situation um, had better rethink their position. Um, I think we, you know, right now we're so focused on short term things like can we open right this minute, um, but we have to think about where, where this is going to be long term. And, you know, I fully expect that for the next two to three years we're going to be struggling with these same issues. So if we're going to be closing the schools now when things are as good as they can be, in my view, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that we could get our county rates any lower um, and, and we have good robust protections in place. If we're going to say we can't open now with things like this, we better be prepared to stay closed for two to three years. Um, because I think, I, honestly, um, you know, vaccine development may happen faster than it has for any other vaccine. Um, but we don't know how effective the vaccines are going to be, how durable they're going to be, what the uptake is going to be in the public, how many people are going to accept them and how many are not. Um, are the vaccines going to protect completely or are they just going to protect you from winding up in the hospital? Um, I, think, I think there's a long road ahead. And so while it, it's important to think about the short term issues and the safety of the moment, it's, it's also important to think about what that means for six months from now, for nine months from now, 18 months from now, um, when we're probably still going to be facing many of the same questions, hopefully with more data. But, you know, the epidemiology may, may still be very similar. Well, Dr. Snedeker, you answered my question, so uh, it was asked <laughs> by Ann. Um, but I appreciate you uh, having us try to think long term. And so if I heard correctly, and so it's sort of a question in the form of a statement, that the things and the measures that we're trying to put in place um, are the way to put us on the right path for a long-term solution that we have to be thinking long-term about the um, safety and well-being and health concerns of our buildings and our students and those interactions. And this may change and alter the way in which we think about education as one aspect of it, but just sort of human interaction um, in general. Is, is that a safe statement? Yes, I think so. Rob, I'm all set. Thank you. Right. Um, anything else for, for Dr. at this point? Dr. Brown, you're good. Uh, everyone else, Chris? Okay. Um, Thank you so much, Dad. This has been uh, very, very helpful, Dr. Really, really appreciate it. But um, um, heard, some, heard and read similar sentiments, but it's great to hear it from, uh, from you being local and your experience and your expertise. So it's really very, very much appreciated. Sure, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to make myself available in the future. Um, you also have a terrific resource in your uh, school physician, Melissa Dandali, who has done yeoman work on behalf of the district. Um, she's a real resource and uh, I've, I've been talking in her ear a little bit, but she, she's been doing most of the work on your behalf and she deserves tremendous credit for that. We all agree with that. That's a great uh, statement to end with, Doctor. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. Welcome. Have a good evening. Dr. Brown, what, uh, what else do we have? I think I rest my case. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's about all we have tonight. We've talked about uh, the $1.2 million we are investing. Uh, and COVID related costs to enhance our buildings and our systems. Um, and we have, you know, the facilities committee heard and saw the slide that referenced the individual pieces that we purchased. I could do that again, but that's overkill at this point, but we're investing a significant amount of funds to enhance our buildings to be prepared for what Dr. Snyder could just refer to as a multi-year approach to battling this deadly disease. Um, 
and you've heard from some of the experts in the field in, in our community uh, who we've been conversing with about how to plan for reopening. So that's where we are right now. Uh, my team and I can take any questions if there are some, but uh, otherwise we are, we, we've shared a lot tonight. It's something that I hope our community listen to. Right, Dr. Brown, it's, um, it's August 25th and September 4th, all, all staff is back to work in PD. Is that um, my understanding? Yeah, what's the three? Go ahead, Lily, go ahead and share. Yeah. Uh-oh. You're on mute, Lily. So sorry, I muted my phone and my computer, my apologies. Yes, yeah, September 3rd is when all of our staff return and begin engaging in professional development and our focus areas are going to continue to be blended learning approaches, culturally responsive and anti-racist teaching practices, integrated social emotional learning, and also health and safety practices. And uh, we're looking forward to engaging folks over the course of those first five days prior to welcoming students in the distance learning environment on September 14th. Any, any other comments, questions at this point? Um, I'd, I'd like to make the comment that I think this, um, this board meeting and the speakers you brought in um, provided the most help and clarity of any board meeting that I've been part of in the last nine years. Um, just as far as, you know, what, what we really need to think about as a community, that it's not just kicking the can down the road another four weeks and another four weeks and another four weeks. We are really talking about the future of our educational system and our schools and our kids and our community. And we are, we are incredibly fortunate to have a remarkably low transmission rate. I thought it was very interesting that Dr. Snedeker brought up that transmission rates in schools mirror communities and that they don't, they don't trigger outbreaks. And I hope that's something that, that people will really, really think about. Um, uh, I, I really think also that it speaks to the good sense of um, undergraduate and graduate students coming back to Cornell that looks like they did quarantine and it looks like they did self isolate and we are not, we're getting an order of magnitude of infection rates lower than their modeling predicted that they could handle. And um, they have a really solid plan to protect the community. Um, I, hope that, I hope that that gives people some peace of mind and confidence. Um, I think that's about as far as I can go right now. Um, but I found all the speakers tonight to be inspirational and I will be thinking a lot about what they've said. Thanks, Pat. Anyone else? Uh, uh, hey, hey team, this is Eldridge. Um, I guess the only thing I can add after everything I've heard is, you know, again, I'm proud to be, proud to be a Cornelian, proud to be part of an institution that's willing to go in a different direction based on expertise and experience of real life. I think Sean said it best up that hill. You're not talking about the CDC. You're talking to the CDC. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fauci is a graduate of Cornell uh, University Medical College back in the day. Um, we're about as close to 
being able to figure this out as, as, as anyone, I, I, I can only add that it is our job, and this was a huge step for that, but it is our job as a board, as an executive team, to um, continue to have these open conversations and invite our teachers and their union leadership and all the rest of our bargaining units to participate in these conversations, to hear what experts are saying, to understand the investments we're making, and to make informed decisions. Each of these decisions is so personal uh, that far be it for me or anybody to tell, even advise folks what they should factor into their decision making. This is, this is beyond my pay grade. But we are going to do the best we can to make sure people feel as safe as possible. Um, I would encourage our bargaining units again to participate in this process. I have to serve on several boards, one of an organization town that did not have a union that went through something similar. And once a single case broke out, there was a lot of national heat, there was a lot of uncertainty, there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of um, folks not feeling that they were protected because they weren't participating as much as they could and they didn't have the information about what was being done behind the scenes to do the best job possible. If anyone asks us to do anything more than that, you are clearly making a decision that there is nothing we will ever be able to do to make you feel 100% safe. So participate and hold us responsible for communicating appropriately about the investments and the steps we are taking. Thank you all involved. Eldred, I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I completely agree. Um, Pat, I have a slight disagreement, um, respectfully, that it hasn't been the most informative for me, but this has been the most critical. I don't think the stakes have been any higher than where we find ourselves today. Um, as some of my board colleagues know that I am a wannabe carpenter. I know, given everything else that I do, right? And the reason why I mention that is that there's a great difference between the ideation and the actuality. So the idea of building something is vastly different when you get down to the details and try to make things work. And so what we're asking for is for input, is for support, is for people to join into the effort as we create these innovative ideas and turn them into reality. And so um, I'm also looking forward to the next couple of weeks. I know that they're gonna be grinding and grueling. Uh, I know that we had a grinding and grueling summer and that we're not near the end yet. Um, but uh, we got some work to do in the best interest of our young folks that we are trying to work towards and work for. And uh, I'm looking forward to that work. So thank you to my board colleagues. Thank you to the guests who were there this evening. Thank you to our teachers and to our support staff. And uh, let's continue to do this good work. Um, I, I just have one comment I just wanted to pick up on. One thing that Dr. Snedeker said that um, sticks with me is the idea that what we're determining now is a long range view as opposed to the short term view. And, and uh, that I really appreciate that um, insight into that and different way of kind of looking at it. So that is kind of what I'm going away thinking about is, um, you know, beyond the time horizon for like next, next week or next month. Um, so that's just uh, where, where I'm at in terms of my thinking in terms of importance. Uh, hey folks, I just want to piggyback on some things that Eldred shared. And uh, one of the things is he said making people feel safe, but you know, if everyone is doing the best practices consistently for the majority of folks, they should be safe. Um, and that's really what we're working towards here, making sure we have everything lined up as much as possible. And I like the fact that we had these experts come in and speak to what actually gets done um, to identify solutions to, these, to this current COVID situation, which is unprecedented. Um, and Eldred's correct, you know, when situations happen and folks aren't at the table to have the conversation and participate and something goes wrong, then they aren't supported. And so welcoming folks to the table to have this dialogue, to identify any gaps or opportunities is extremely important because I think everyone's ultimate goal 
is to move children and adults safely back into these buildings. Um, and I think, and I think, you know, what Dr. Snydecker shared um, was really sobering to me is that if we can't do it as low as numbers are right now, uh, then we're going to have a real problem moving down the road. And I know everyone's ultimate goal is zero positive cases. And we need to be realistic with what we're facing here um, because there are going to be more positive cases with kids in school and out of school. It's what we do to set it up to be as little as possible moving forward. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Um, I will, if there's no one else, um, for me, Dr. Brown, um, I will, um, the impactful statement from the good doctor was, if not now, when? So, Dr. Brown, it's um, bad. Is that it's not going to get any better than it is right now? And so, we will do what we have to do and will do to ensure that our buildings are open safely. But open they are, and open they will. And um, so, let's let's work on this and and move forward. Um, Anything else, Dr. Brown? You've been long days, and we're approaching another hour here. So I think uh, if if everybody's good, if there's no other uh, no other comments, discussion, um, there is. Rob, I, I feel ahead. compelled to add. If we are talking about innovation and transformation, to hear you quote Dr. King is an indication of our transformation in this community. So. Uh, I appreciate that quote. Thank you very much, Rob. Sean, it's just, um, you know, how many times do I have to hang around with an MLK scholar and, uh, and not have a rub off? I mean, you know, um, I did always just sit in the back of the classroom and not to try, really not to ever get called on, but I did listen, you know, I did actually listen sometimes. So um, it's all good. So, um, we're, um, it is only Tuesday, so there's still lots of uh, time this week to get work done. And uh, there's work sessions next week, but uh, exec team, uh, let us know if uh, you need anything from us, obviously, this week. Um, we as the board will have more opportunities to discuss, And uh, but I think this was an impactful evening, uh, and I appreciate uh, the community coming up and rising up and and again, realizing that, uh, that the ICSD and public education is, is critical to this community. Not only now, not only next week, but yes, over the next three years, and it's been critical for 100 years or longer. And um, so we're here to preserve that. Um, and we are at a critical stage. And so uh, in order to preserve the Ithaca ideal and, uh, and this district, uh, in this community, we need to um, we need to move forward, and, and it's going to take the, our best thinking and our best uh, abilities to uh, to get us through and get uh, and and meet the needs of every kid in this community. So I will start with that. I'm going to end with that, and uh, and thanks everyone. And uh, it's still summer. Um, enjoy, be outside, um, and do great work. And um, and I'll come back to work tomorrow. So it's all good. So I've been doing that since March 16th. So it's all good. So uh, thanks everybody. Have a great uh, have a great rest of the night and we'll all we'll see you all soon.